kings from Babylon to Baghdad. Mesopotamia. The Greek word for ancient Iraq means the land between the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. The Mesopotamian plain, part of the Fertile Crescent, was a perfect environment with abundant water for civilization to flourish. An advanced tribal culture developed in this region long before Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Tribes turned into settlements, settlements into towns. By 3500 BC, the world's very first cities, Uruk and Ur, rose in southern Mesopotamia, a region also known as Sumer. It's the place that saw the development for the first time on the planet Earth of virtually all of those social and political and technological things that we associate with civilized life. The world's earliest writing systems developed in Mesopotamia. The world's first kings the invention of the wheel, the invention of the plow, the development of the state as a way of organizing political life. By 2900 BC, the patchwork of Mesopotamia's 30 or so city-states hardly comprised a cohesive empire. Each had its own king, its own patron god or goddess, and a competing area of agricultural fields. Rival cities created alliances to bolster their own independence or to conquer their neighbors. The distances between these cities were actually quite small. And because the irrigation land was so valuable, these cities were constantly at war with one another for the smallest of advantages. By 2334 BC, one king came to dominate Mesopotamia, Sargon the Great. As far as we know, there are no images of Sargon that survive. But we can guess what he would have looked like. He would have looked, uh, at least in his portraits, the way that Mesopotamian kings tended to look, which was uh, powerful, strong. The ancient form of Sargon's name, Sharukin, means the legitimate king. A strong hint, scholars say, that he was a usurper. In a Moses-like legend about his origins, Sargon was the illegitimate son of a priestess. So she put him in a basket after he was born and floated him in the river. And the basket then was discovered by a gardener who raised him. And then he went into the service of the king of Kish. Enterprising, ambitious, and ruthless. Sargon overthrew King Zababa of Kish and declared himself the city's new ruler. He also reigned at Agade, the capital city he built north of Sumer in the state of Akkad, though its precise location is still unknown. With his Akkadian army, Sargon started to take control of southern Mesopotamia. His first conquest was the city of Uruk, where he captured and then humiliated Uruk's king Lugalzagezi by dragging him away on a leash. And then after he conquered Uruk, he conquered other southern Mesopotamian cities. And then he seems to have thought, for whatever reason, I can keep going. 
he wasn't content simply as the earlier Sumerian kings had been to, to fight local battles. He wanted to take over what was then the known world. Remarkably, he did just that. Over a 56-year reign, Sargon conquered North Mesopotamia, North Syria, and eventually reached the Mediterranean to capture Southeast Turkey. Sargon built the world's first empire. It's the first king in the world to decide to take over lands that were occupied by people of different nationalities, different languages, different gods. And he was somebody that Mesopotamian kings from that time onwards looked up to. He was the king that really set the ground rules for what it was to be an emperor. Sargon's empire was not only unique in scale, but also in organization. He tried to unify this vast area and reorganize it in a way that it had never been done before. Every city in Mesopotamia had its own system of weights and measures. Sargon standardized weights and measures throughout the whole area he had conquered. And by doing that, he made it possible to have um, trade over vast distances. Sargon's novel ideas weren't limited to empire building, but extended to the military as well. He was the first king who claimed to have a standing army. Drafted from all cities in the empire, it was a huge force of 5,400 men that proved expensive to maintain. So Sargon instituted a new tradition to help feed his troops. Plundering. They fed themselves, the army, uh, from the land there so that the campaigns were more or less set to go at the point when the harvest was completed throughout Mesopotamia. That is one age of terror that you don't want to live through. Being outside of Akkad and not a member of that inner elite and knowing that every year you are going to be faced with this kind of slaughter. Sargon reigned until his death in 2279 BC. His dynasty continued to rule for another 82 years. Yet, as imposing as the Akkadian Empire was, it also proved fragile. In 2197 BC, the kingdom fell to raiders from the Zagros Mountains in Persia. Soon, a new king will emerge. Using Sargon as his role model, Hammurabi would single-handedly create a legendary city. And all of a sudden, he's turning up on the borders with his army ready to, to fight. In 2197 BC, chaos followed the fall of the Akkadian Empire that originated with Sargon. Finally, in 2112, the kings of Ur restored stability. Then, a new threat appeared from the northwest. A nomadic people called Amorites terrified the Mesopotamians. They saw the Amorites as barbarians. Their descriptions of them, these are people who um, don't farm, they don't live in houses, they live in tents. They don't bury their dead on the day that they die. They don't cook their meat. But rather than causing turmoil, by 1900 BC, the Amorites had completely assimilated into Mesopotamian life. They became soldiers, farmers, and businessmen, and rose to the ranks of governor and general. They consolidated their hold on Mesopotamia 
by founding dynasties in the cities of Isin, Larsa, Eshnuna, and Babylon. It turned out to be actually a good thing for Mesopotamia in the end that the Amorites came because some of the greatest Mesopotamian kings were Amorites. In 1792 BC, the greatest ruler of Babylon's Amorite dynasty, Hammurabi, came to the throne as its sixth king. Initially, he didn't seem to be interested in military campaigns. He ruled for 43 years. And starting in his 30th year, he gets it into his head to emulate Sargon to build himself an empire. He starts campaigning against the neighboring kingdoms. And these are neighboring kingdoms that had previously been allies. These are some of them he had long-standing relationships with. And all of a sudden, he's turning up on the borders with his army ready to, to fight, ready to take them over. Hammurabi's military campaigns were distinguished by the growing popularity of hostage-taking for ransom. There were merchants who specialized in this, who would go and ransom the Babylonian soldiers from the enemy. They would pay the ransom, and then they were required to be paid back. So they're a win-win situation for the, for the merchant, because they would make a profit off these ransoms that they were paying. Hammurabi's conquests extended from the Persian Gulf to Syria. Although his empire wasn't as big as Sargon's had been, scholars rate Hammurabi as the greatest empire builder since Sargon. However, he set himself apart from the former king. Whereas Sargon seems to have relied upon his power and his almost terror tactics to keep people under control, Hammurabi presents himself almost like a modern politician in that he wants to be loved. He wants the people to like him. He's going to set up laws that will protect them, not laws that will terrify them and force them into submission. Hammurabi's fame grew from his conquests, but his greatness came from his concern with justice. Toward the end of his reign, he erected several monuments in his cities. The largest one to remain intact is a stone slab known today as the Hammurabi Stele, a collection of 282 legal verdicts. They're written in a wedge-shaped script called cuneiform, the earliest known writing developed in Sumer at the end of the fourth millennium. If a slave says to the master, you are not my master, the master shall cut off the slave's ear. If a man brings an accusation of murder against another man without providing proof, the accuser shall be put to death. If a woman is not discreet but a gadabout, thus neglecting her house and discrediting her husband, they shall throw this woman in the water. Hammurabi's plan for administering justice was extensive. His civil and criminal regulations covered many subjects, including commercial, family, and property law, prices and wages, and slavery regulations and fees. Some of them seem very sensible to us. Hammurabi, so that the court spends a lot of time on specifying the social position of a married woman when she's at fault for doing something, when she's not, what her property rights are. Laws that seem very, very advanced to us nowadays and very much not, uh, unexpected. On the other hand, what we find in the Hammurabi Code is the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth passages that totally parallel the biblical notion of that. Hammurabi's justice was not necessarily equitable. Rights varied based on an individual's status as a landowning free citizen a civil servant, or a slave. If you, as a citizen, kill a slave, you might get away with just paying a fine. If you kill another citizen, you most likely are going to be killed for that yourself. So certainly in the old Babylonian period, not all animals were equal. 
The articulation of law by Hammurabi was not the first time people in Mesopotamia were given a code to live by. But Hammurabi's effort was the most comprehensive and sophisticated. Following Hammurabi's reign, southern Mesopotamia became known as Babylonia, a unified kingdom. And Babylon became Mesopotamia's political, cultural, and religious center. So it was really Hammurabi's doing that made Babylon uh, what it was and what it would be under the Neo-Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, when it was this great, huge metropolis of the ancient world. In 1750 BC, illness compelled Hammurabi to surrender the throne to his son. By 1000 BC, Babylon had established a lasting national state in the south. Meanwhile, the city of Asher dominated a similar rival state, Assyria, in the north. Soon, the region's rulers, like its desert sands, would undergo a remarkable shift. Babylonia will compete for power against North Mesopotamia, home to the ancient world's fiercest fighting machine, the Assyrians. empires were getting bigger and bigger and more and more ruthless. The Assyrians, a Semitic people, had inhabited North Mesopotamia for at least 4,000 years. By the 9th century BC, their conquests extended far beyond Asher, the capital city and heartland of Assyria. From 885 to 860 BC, Assyrian king Ashur-Nazirpal II was intensely focused on military matters. He wants to build up the power of Assyria. It had previously, several hundred years earlier, had been a major power. And Ashur-Nazirpal seems to have been determined to reinstate it as a major power. And the whole emphasis of the administration is on military matters. Ashur-Nazirpal's campaign set a standard for the future warrior kings of Assyria, who were ruthless, determined empire builders. The reliefs that are carved into the walls of the palaces of the Assyrian kings show siege engines ripping apart the walls of enemy cities. We see warships with battering rams on them. We see chariots. We see cavalry. We see infantry digging tunnels underneath the walls of the cities that they're besieging. The empires were getting bigger and bigger and more and more ruthless. The sadistic cruelty Ashur Nazirpal inflicted on war captives and his own subjects protesting taxation was legendary. He would make a point of being as brutal as possible. He describes in gruesome detail flaying people, putting their skins on the wall of the city, making pillars of decapitated heads. Really horrible, gruesome stuff. According to scholars, he probably didn't do it everywhere. He would take one city and do it as an example and terrify everyone else into obeying. By the time of Ashur Nazirpal's death in 860 BC, his kingdom extended north to the borders of modern eastern Turkey and to the Mediterranean Sea. In the century following his reign, a lust to control Babylonia dominated the Assyrian monarchy. The Assyrian kings wanted to be king of the four quarters of the universe, or they wanted to be king of everything. 
Now they didn't know how big the world was. Everything was them and Babylonia. And if Babylonia was outside of that, then they weren't king of the four quarters of the universe. So it, they needed, I think, perhaps to feel they controlled it. But the Babylonians, it seemed, had their own ideas about how they wanted to live. Babylonia refused to buy into Assyria as its overlord, and so was constantly breaking away. And Assyria tried a number of different things. They would put their own Babylonian king on, they would put the son of the Assyrian king on, the Assyrian king themselves would be the king. Still, no matter what trouble was brewing between the two cultures, the Assyrians, ironically, always held the Babylonian civilization in high regard. Even though the Assyrians were all powerful, they still had a sense of cultural inferiority vis-a-vis -vis Babylonia. They saw Babylonia uh, as the source of uh, the best tablets, uh, real cuneiform culture, much as uh, in the 19th century, Americans might have looked to England as, you know, the place where you would find real English literature and drama and such. The Assyrians also felt a strong bond with the Babylonians. They spoke the same language, they worshipped the same gods, they wore the same clothes. This was a, a sister culture, but it was a much older sister culture and it was one that they had tremendous respect for. But that changed beginning in 704 BC with the reign of the Assyrian king Sennacherib. His army marched south several times to put down revolts in Babylonia. He initially set up a puppet king and that puppet king was removed. And then he put his crown prince on the throne of Babylon. This was his loved son. He, he was his eldest son. It was the man who was going to become king of Assyria after him. He was doing the Babylonians, presumably he thought, a great favor by blessing them with, with his son. In 688 BC, Sennacherib's son, Ashur Nadin Shumi, was captured and killed by an invading army. Sennacherib blamed the Babylonians for failing to protect and defend him. His relationship with the Babylonians got worse and worse. And in the end, he did what was unthinkable in a way, which was to go in and besiege Babylon. And he was brutal to it. But I pressed upon the enemy like the onset of a raging storm. I decimated the enemy host with arrow and spear. All their bodies I bored through like a sieve. I cut their throats like lambs. He destroyed the city. He burned down buildings, he razed temples. He took the statues of gods and had his soldiers destroy them. Now, this is complete desecration. It's, it's, it's sacrilege. Then he cursed the city. He said, no one can rebuild Babylon for 70 years. Sennacherib's actions angered the Assyrians, who believed Babylon's destruction invited the gods' wrath. Even the king's own family disliked him. He was killed by his own son. And there are two stories about how he died. One was that he was stabbed. And the other one was that the son took one of those enormous statues of a bull and toppled it on his father. So he was crushed underneath this heavy, heavy stone sculpture. What a horrible way to go. Upon Sennacherib's death, his youngest son, Esarhaddon, became king of Assyria in 680 BC. Immediately, he wanted to rebuild Babylon and correct the huge mistake he believed his father had made. Yet he knew he would not outlive the 70-year curse recorded for posterity on a clay tablet. Desperate, Esarhaddon consulted the priests and made a startling discovery. He discovered it wasn't 70 years after all, that they had been reading the tablet upside down. 
And in fact, it was 11 years, because the, in, the, in the way that numbers are written in cuneiform, 70, if you turn it upside down, is 11. And there it is. All they had to wait was 11 years. Esser Haddon ordered the city rebuilt. He used the spoils from his conquests to help finance the construction. When Esser Haddon died in 669 BC, he left his eldest son, Ashurbanipal, a kingdom that stretched from Egypt to Persia. Ashurbanipal was one of Mesopotamia's most cultured rulers and claimed a unique skill. He said, I, Ashurbanipal, who can read and write. And um, he wanted to have a collection of all the literary works in his kingdom. And he wanted it to be in his palace at Nineveh. Ashurbanipal began sending agents to search out cuneiform tablets in the archives and schools of the Babylonian temples. His scribes then meticulously copied and cataloged some 20,000 of them before they were housed in what was the world's first library. Among the entire collection, though, Ashurbanipal especially valued more than 300 omen texts that he believed predicted the future. If the constellation Aries is faint, the king will encounter misery. If the stars of Orion sparkle, someone influential will get too much power and commit evil deeds. Most of the tablets had to do with the kinds of omen divination that was important for him if he was to rule properly in accord with the will of the gods and really survive as, as king. Ashurbanipal was not only a scholar, but also a military leader. Under his command, the Assyrian Empire controlled the entire Near East, the greatest land area ever in Assyrian rule. So for them, that was the universe, that was everything. But after Ashurbanipal's death in 627 BC, new power brokers would deliver crushing blows to the Assyrian Empire. These guys are forming a pincer's attack on the Assyrian heartland. Late in the 7th century BC, Babylon was in chaos. Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian king who also reigned over Babylon, had died. In the ancient Near East, as soon as one king died, everybody tried to break away, um, thinking that there would be a moment of weakness in the empire. And that's when you have a bit of chaos, because everybody wants a piece of the throne. In 627 BC, a local leader of uncertain origin named Nabopolassar began vying for Babylon's throne. He seems to have been a governor of Babylonia. And in the first millennium, you have a number of different ethnic groups in Babylon and Babylonia. And he is in charge of one of them. He seems to have won these skirmishes and claimed the King of Babylon title. Professing to be a man of the people, King Nabopolassar was determined to win South Mesopotamia's independence from the north. In 626 BC, he began waging war against Babylonia's Assyrian administration. Within 10 years, Nabopolassar had solidified his control over Babylonia, and then began to threaten the Assyrian heartland. He starts ejecting the Assyrian garrisons and then pushing north into Assyria proper. By 615, he's operating with armies in Assyria itself. 
and he's joined there by people pushing in from northern Iran, principally Medes. So either operating independently or in concert, these guys are forming a pincer's attack on the Assyrian heartland. In 614 BC, the Medes sacked the city of Nimrud, and a year later brought down Asher, the spiritual and cultural center of Assyria. In 612, a coalition of Medes and Babylonians marched against Nineveh, and after a three-month siege, Nineveh fell. The once mighty Assyrian Empire was finished. Assyria essentially falls victim to its own drive towards maximization, towards conquering. It's not a country whose power is necessarily based on treaties. And as soon as uh, Assyria's power wanes, it basically stands alone and it falls apart. Nabopolassar's hard-won victory against his city's ages-old rival was sweet. They slaughtered the land of Assyria. They turned the hostile land into heaps and ruins. But the Assyrian, who since distant days had rule over all the peoples, and with his heavy yoke had brought injury to the people of the land, his feet from a cot I turned back, and his yoke I threw off. In 605 BC, Nabopolassar died and was succeeded as king of Babylon by his eldest son, Nebuchadnezzar II. He had served as commander of his father's army and soon proved to be the equal of all the great Mesopotamian conquerors, from Sargon onward. He managed to reign for uh, more than 40 years in the course of which he established Babylonian control over much of the western territories of the former Assyrian Empire. Included in Nebuchadnezzar's empire was the kingdom of Judah. In 600 BC, the king, Jehoiakim, made a fateful decision not to pay annual tribute to Babylon. In revenge, Nebuchadnezzar marched west in December 598 BC and attacked Jerusalem, Judah's capital and the spiritual center of the Jewish people. In a battle lasting three months, the Babylonian army was victorious. Nebuchadnezzar ordered what is known in Jewish history as the exile, the deportation to Babylon of thousands of Jews, including the king and his family. One of the ways of stabilizing a conquered territory was to take a political elite and a social elite that had not proved reliable or cooperative and replace them with a new population of people who had no ties to the place. Nebuchadnezzar had acquired an empire comparable to that of Assyria. Like the Assyrian kings, he devoted much of the empire's resources to refurbishing and enlarging his capital city so that it became the largest metropolis in the ancient world. Those are really efforts that could go into the Guinness Book of Records. The excavator of Babylon estimates that Nebuchadnezzar actually used about 15 million baked bricks in his refurbishment projects of his city. Apparently, Nebuchadnezzar was a perfectionist. The ceremonial Ishtar Gate, with its depiction of mythological animals, was rebuilt three times. Lions on the gate represent the goddess Ishtar, while a demon called Amushushu signifies Marduk, Babylon's principal god and head of the Mesopotamian pantheon. From Ahammurabi's time on, Marduk is one of the great gods of the Near East. He's not the god of anything in particular, but he managed to conquer the, the evil goddess, whose name was Tiamat. She was the goddess of the sea. And he takes her body and he splits it in two. And with the upper part, he creates the heavens, and with the lower part, he creates the earth. 
The Ishtar Gate stood at the end of the processional way that led to Babylon's temples and ziggurat. The 650-foot tall temple tower known as the Tower of Babel. Ziggurats throughout Mesopotamian history, they're a sign of religious architecture. They're massive structures. They take a lot of man hours to build. Only a king with power and wealth can initiate such a project and finish it. And the reasoning behind building the Tower of Babel seems to be personal glory as well. Within Nebuchadnezzar's magnificent palace were hanging gardens. They were reported by the Greek historian Herodotus to have been one of the world's great wonders. The gardens were supposedly constructed for the king's wife, a homesick Iranian princess who was comforted by the terraced buildings and exotic plants. However, the hanging gardens of Babylon may be nothing more than a Unfortunately, in Mesopotamian sources, we have really no indication of any such thing. On the other hand, it is true that one of the things that a good Mesopotamian king did was cultivate royal gardens in which you could display plants and animals from the empire. This was one of the ways of showing the scale and range of conquest and therefore giving a kind of living, breathing, green image of uh, power. Nebuchadnezzar died at the age of 84 in 562 BC. During his reign, Babylon's arts, sciences, and literature flourished under considerable wealth and strong state support. But all was not perfect beneath the shining surface. Next, Babylon comes under the control of a king loyal to the enemy. In June 556 BC, a commoner named Nabonidus became king of Babylon in the aftermath of a bloody coup. He was immediately unpopular with Babylon's priests and people. Not only did he claim to have been a loyal subject of the city's old nemesis, Assyria, but he also ignored Babylon's principal god, Marduk, in favor of the god of his mother. Nebuchadnezzar is very much close to his mother, who seems to be a priestess dedicated to the god Sin, the moon god. In 549 BC, Nabonidus did the unthinkable. He left his son Belshazzar in charge and for a decade abandoned Babylon to build and restore temples devoted to the moon god in Tama in southern Arabia and Haran in north Mesopotamia. The people in Babylon are quite unhappy with Nabonidus because they feel like he has forsaken them. Belshazzar failed to take seriously a looming threat, Persian imperialism. The Achaemenid dynasty in southwestern Iran was becoming the dominant force in the Near East. They owed their success to rigorous military training. Persian boys had to learn how to ride horses well, as well as the art of archery. And so in these two military tactics, the Persians were quite good. In 559 BC, a new king ascended the Achaemenid throne, who had a quality not usually found in a conqueror. Tolerance. His name was Cyrus the Great. In 10 years, he became famous not only for his military prowess, but also for a bloodless victory against the Iranian Medes. 
he is going to take on this amazing campaign of first conquering the Iranian plateau, which was ruled by the Medes. Before the battle, a large number of the Median contingent, their forces actually come to Cyrus and desert the Median ruler. And hence, uh, he's victor before even the battle begins. By 546 BC, Cyrus had amassed a vast empire, stretching from Asia Minor in the west to the Iranian plateau in the east. All that was left was Babylon. Mesopotamia's political, cultural, and religious center, and Babylonian territories in Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. Conquering them would mean the birth of a new world empire, a feat Cyrus couldn't resist. Babylon is the center of the world, the capital of the world at this time. Once Cyrus steps into Babylonia, and the city of Babylon, he pretty much has changed world history. You are now the master of the capital of the world. Now he's going to descend upon Babylonia. In 539 BC, Nabonidus returned to save his kingdom, but he was too late. The Persians killed Belshazzar, captured Nabonidus, and then took Babylon without any resistance. The Babylonians were tired of their absent king and welcomed Cyrus not as a conqueror, but as a liberator. In fact, green twigs are placed before his feet. A state of peace is imposed into the city. One of the first thing that he does is to go to the temple of Marduk perform the rites and rituals which Nabonidus had forsaken. Nabonidus was exiled to central Iran, where he was given a government post as part of a Persian policy of amnesty. Cyrus took the title King of Babylon and King of the Lands. By pursuing a policy of generosity instead of repression, and by favoring the local religion, he was able to make enthusiastic supporters of his new subjects. Cyrus also reached out to Babylon's Jewish population, and in 537 BC, he let 40,000 exiles return to Palestine. The Jews considered him a savior who delivered them from 60 years of captivity. Under the rule of the Achaemenid Persian kings, southern Mesopotamia flourished for some 200 years. Babylon remained the economic center of the empire and was the winter residence of the Persian court. 